Um, and I take this from the Duke Ellington approach. You, you write for your band. So am I going to pick something that's going to really showcase my band or is it really going to, eh, it's going to expose us in a bad way, right? So that, that's the goal. And I always pick something to challenge them and to challenge me as well. Because I, I, it doesn't have to be a super hard tune. Like, I think any kind of, any level of music is difficult in some way. This episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Gurus Hang podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. My guest for this episode is Stephen Cunningham. On the road to attaining his doctorate, Stephen had no desire to be an educator, but life has a funny way of bringing your real purpose to light. His path has gone from being a full-time working pro to a university teaching position to finally returning to his roots as the high school music teacher at his alma mater in Virginia. Stephen is caring, passionate, and is committed to paying it forward. In other words, a great teacher. So pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin. And welcome to a fresh new edition of the Trumpet Gurus Hang, and I am joined by Mr. Stephen Cunningham. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. I'm enjoying my Thanksgiving break. So, oh, Thanksgiving break. Yes, that's a <laughs> wonderful thing. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, so you're down in in, uh, in Virginia, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. So, uh, what have you been up to these days, man? Well, the past couple of years, I've been in uh, Grambling, uh, Louisiana, teaching at Grambling State as assistant professor there and slash assistant band director. So I was a full-time professor and I was assistant band director for the marching band. Uh, so it was a pretty, pretty heavy job, you know, big time tradition there, um, but decided to come back home and, and raise my family here, uh, close yeah. to the family. So, yeah. Well, you know, family is important. So, uh, uh, yeah, grambling, yeah, yeah, grambling for, for those people who aren't, aren't hip to it. Uh, you talked about the tradition. Grambling has their, their marching band. I mean, I remember watching them, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, you know, like uh, showing up on those, uh, those bowl games and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And yeah, the, the, um, uh, I mean, the combination of the music and the movement you know because this this isn't like a drum corps kind of you know thing this this is definitely a, a, a lot more uh funky and energetic and and uh and the stuff that 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 grambling is famous for um i mean what what was that like in terms of like the time commitment to of, of working with with a program and, and how you know you talk about the the tradition i mean um how does it feel being in you know in those kind of situations where it's like you've got so much history that you've got to try and live up to. I mean, how do you balance, you know, the 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 past and trying to move things forward into the the future? Yeah, great question. Um, especially uh, when I came in, I, I'm not a Grambling grad graduate, so I didn't march in in the band uh, during my undergrad. So I had I came in, you know, fresh. You know, just had to learn everything in my first year. Um, and it's it's something that's not typical, especially at the band director rank. Um, so at Grambling, it was, it was five of us, uh, five band directors. I, I'm the youngest. I didn't go to school there. I, I didn't do college marching band. So this was all brand new. And, and, and HBCU marching bands is a totally different ball game. Um, it's really intense. Um, showmanship it has to be 100% all the time. Um, playing ability has to be 100%. Uh, so I really had to learn the tradition in my first year. And I had so much respect for Grambling. I saw Grambling on the, on the Drumline movie. Uh, Drumline came out when I was in high school. Yeah. So I was very familiar with it and just... It was like, wow, this is the band that was on that movie. 
you know, and then I had to dig deeper, you know, than playing on the first Super Bowl and playing in, in Japan and like going all over the country, playing at professional ball games and stuff like that. So it, it, it was it was it was a lot. <laughs> um, and then the time commitment, uh, I answer that the time commitment man, rehearsing every day. Um, and because I was a professor, I, I taught like music theory, uh, applied trumpet, music appreciation, like like everything. And I did a jazz band too. So I did that from like 8 a.m. to like 3.30 and then band practice until whenever. <laughs> so you had to get stuff done, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and and that's the thing. I mean, I, when I was uh, when I was a, a lot younger, I went, to, you know, obviously went to the, the high school marching band thing. But then I also uh, was a, a assistant director at my old high school, actually, for for a while. You know, uh, working with the marching band, uh, in, in specifically. But I mean, I remember because it was a very, you know, the school was was a very competitive, you know, in, in the the marching band world. You know, we, we used to go to all the tournaments and stuff like that. But I mean, I remember the amount of time that it took, and this is, you know, in working with a high school band, which obviously has a lot more restrictions in terms of how late you can go and how many hours you can put in. Um, I can only imagine, you know, the the craziness that goes on at the collegiate level, and especially with a band like, like Gramblings. So, uh, you know, when you say, as, as long as it takes, I mean, What's the latest you've ever had to be out on the field? Man. Mm. I think I was out there one night till like 9.30. And that's starting like at, at 3.30 3. or 4? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, of course, you had breaks for, you know, food. You had to eat and stuff like that. But it's... You don't have to eat, man. What are you talking about? You don't need to eat. <laughs> No, man, I'm a small guy. I got to eat. <laughs> oh, but yeah, it's, it's intense. And I think if you talk to anybody uh, who's marched in any of those bands in the HBCUs, they'll tell you that. Like, it's, it's intense. And you, you have to get stuff done. And at Grambling, we did different field shows pretty much every game, every Friday. So they're changing the field show every week. Yeah. Uh, so, and the kids, the kid, the students, I say kids, the students, you know, they had to memorize everything like, like this, the, the coordination and what Grambling, they played and marched at the same time um, yeah. and danced, excuse me, we danced too. So that's a whole, that's a whole nother ball game. Yeah. Um, I was sitting there watching them rehearse and just like doing the first of all you gotta get the music together and then to add the dance routines man it's it was something special to see and i got to see it firsthand yeah yeah i can only imagine man the energy has to be amazing you know because uh, you know, like you said it's, it's the the music which you know obviously you have to perform it at a high level uh and it's uh, you know, just the the energy, of the dance, and just the, you know all of that that tradition and everything just coming together into in this this one moment. I mean, it it has to be surreal. I mean, because I mean, standing in front of any marching band, you know, the energy level because of just you know the volume and the amount of people that you have in front of you already boosts things up. But when you start adding all these other other things to it, uh, you know, I could only imagine that you know the 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 feeling has to be very palpable you know you 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 feel the music and you feel the excitement and get engaged with that yeah absolutely and and keep in mind you're playing for like at these football games you're playing for like thousands and thousands of people um especially with grambling you know we play southern at the body classic every year thanksgiving this time, you know, you're playing for hundreds of thousands of people in New Orleans, the Superdome. So it's 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 amazing. And then being on the field and you know the directors, you'll have the 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 head band director on, you know, directing the songs. 
uh, during the field show, uh, the assistant directors, we're, you know, we're kind of stationed around, you know, making sure everything is cool. And you just, you just see the intensity uh, the students have when they're, they're putting on that show. And just to see the, the crowd reaction, like all this hard effort and hard work that they put in, long rehearsals, everything, it just comes out in that seven minutes. You yeah. know, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, like oh, you know, always saying, yeah, leave it, leave it all on the field, man. You know, when you're out there, <laughs> you know, it, it's a hundred percent from everybody. So uh, it actually usually ends up being a little bit more because you you get so pumped up, you know, and and you start uh, you, you start doing things sometimes you, that you didn't think you had inside of you. So uh, yeah, I I, I kind of miss those days, you know, but I don't miss those long hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth it. it. It's it's a lot of it's a lot of work. It's longer hours, and but I think the students learn so much from doing it. Uh, a lot of life skills that that can you can apply to any career. You know, it doesn't have to be a you know music. Uh, they can apply that to any career that they choose to go to. And man, I think any employer would would love that kind of dedication and, and hard work. Yeah. I mean, I know, you know, I know a lot of guys who, who marched core um, and, you know, obviously, you know, when, when you do that, um, you, you, you get some chops, you know, because you're out there blowing and, and, you know, you, you've got to, you've got to be able to project, you've got to have the endurance, you know, all, you know, you've got to have intonation, you have to have good time. So all the things you need to be a good musician, you know, especially if you're a trumpet player. Um, but like you're saying, there's that other side to it. And uh, uh, I interviewed uh, Dan Fenero, uh, I think it was last year. Uh, and Dan was talking about the impact that uh, Marching and Drum Corps had on him uh, in terms of learning a lot about uh, how to be a good all-around player, how to be a, not not like the musical side, but the ability to be a team player to be uh you know able to to understand the discipline and you know that you're you you are part of this whole uh and you have to be able to, to hold yourself down you have to be you know dedicated you have to be disciplined and all those sort of things so um it's kind of like you know the army or you know the military you know obviously will, will you know teach you those kind of traits but i think the thing about doing like marching band and, and corps and things like that is that you learn a lot of those same skills, but you also have the music involved in it, you know, so you have the artistic side. So I think that that anybody who uh, gets an opportunity to do something like that should absolutely do it because uh, like you said, man, there's some life skills in there that, that you're just not going to get very many other places. Right. Yep. And, and then the, the process, like on the musical side, if you, they continue and, you know, do music professionally, you know, you're memorizing probably like 50 songs, you know, to play. Yeah. You have to do it together with your section. They, they do the sectionals a lot. Um, and then they bring it together with the whole band. And it's like everybody's in. They have to be all in. Yeah. And if you're that one person that messes up during a performance, you're going to stick out. Yeah. You no. Know? So you have to take it seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Now you said that you you also uh directed a, a jazz band. So I mean, I know I know Grambling, you know, definitely when I think about Grambling and music, I think about the marching band. Uh right. <laughs> but what was the the jazz program like there? When when I came in, it was it for, so first off, um it was Dr. Pinnell. He I came in the the year after, like he retired, I believe in 2018. I came in that fall. So he would he was the the director of bands there, and he he also directed the jazz band as well. So I came in. I didn't really know um, what was going on, but I I had an idea of what I wanted to do with the program. I just wanted I wanted to get the the students to play traditional literature. Just like a lot of them never heard of Duke Ellington, Cal Basie, Thad Jones, you know, 
they just they never heard of that and i made a an effort to bring the tradition in so they can learn that learn their history and and it's that music is hard so if you actually learn how to play that play that the big band style uh, music swing learn how to swing like with authority uh, you can take that those skills to other any other style of music you want to do so i ordered the whole um atomic basie album I, I ordered the sheet music for it and man we was work we were working on that stuff so if i had stayed there uh longer man it, you know who knows but that was that was the focus there i, I was an adjunct at virginia commonwealth university I, I did my undergrad there but i came back as an adjunct when i finished my doctorate at umd with chris gecker mm -hmm. and I had the chance to, you know, be under the leadership of Antonio Garcia. He's the director of jazz studies there. And man, I learned so many things from him on like how to run the program and just like how to pick tunes and, you know, how to rehearse. So I took the things I learned from VCU as an adjunct and took it to, took it with me to Grambling. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, I think like, you know, you're talking about Basie. Um, I love Basie, you know, because that band really, I mean, it could, and it still does. I mean, it, it's still going, the band is still going strong. Um, but the feel to play Basie and especially the atomic Basie, that, that's like, that's, that's classic. You know, that is just some of the, the most classic iconic Basie stuff that you're ever going to do. But, you know, that ability to, to stay in the pocket um, and th the feel that you have to have to play a bassy tune as opposed to, you know, say something that's a little more burning, uh, you know, that, that maybe you're a little bit more on top or even ahead of the beat a little bit, you know, but, but bassy, you know, you have to have that ability to kind of, you know, sit back a little bit. Um, and it just, it's, it's so, it sounds so cool and it sounds so simple but it's so hard to do and, you know, by yourself, but let alone to try and get an entire ensemble to lock into that. And, you know, I, I can see how that was just, you know, that had to be rewarding and challenging at the same time. Oh yeah. And, and doing tunes like, I, I think everybody, well, not everybody, but I think a lot of people underestimate Lil Darling. Oh, I think that's one of the hardest tunes to play as an ensemble. <laughs> Cause like everybody has to be on one accord, and we have to feel that beat. Just especially the horns, just sitting back, and then if one person is off, you're exposed. You yeah. know. Um, so yeah, it, we we did a lot of stuff like that. Um, but I I mixed it up a little bit now. Yeah, uh -huh. I did arrange some. Um, I did some hip hop. I did some some definitely gospel. I'm I'm a big uh, gospel fan, so I like to do. Uh, I, I wrote a lot of the gospel tunes that Grambling uh, played when I was there. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know the marching band. So I would bring. I would just arrange it for the, the jazz band, and you know we'll play stuff like that. Um, so I, I didn't stick to just doing like the tradition. I wanted the kids to, uh, you know, get something that they you know, they might encounter now yeah, as well. So try to get them to be a little bit, you know, well-rounded and, yeah. and see the connection from that era going on. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, I think that that's, that is such a crucial point. And I'm so glad that you said that because, um, you know, there are a lot of people that are jazz purists, you know, and it's like nothing that was recorded after, you know, 1960-ish uh, is, jazz you know real jazz um and then you you know you have people that you know might like most people they they only listen to what they listen to so you know being able to to take the traditions and give you know give the youth a chance to learn about the history that's behind their music and play their their modern music and and be able to to kind of go yeah well i can see how 
this music evolved into this. I can see the influences. I can see you know, how this all works together and I can see how the skills build on each other. I mean, I think that that is the mark of, of, a, of a great teacher. So, you know, I have to have to give you some props for that. Now, you, you had said that you learned you learned about programming, uh, how to pick, you know, pick your literature and things like that. Um, so so what are some of the the things that that stick out or like, like you would say, OK, well, this is kind of my approach. And this is uh, these are some of the tips that I would give to a uh, educator who's looking to develop a, a nice repertoire for their their band. Uh, I think it, it's really, that kind of stuff really depends on the, on the, the personality of the director. Um, I'm one of those people, I, I can't, so like on my trumpet playing, I don't write out, you know, somebody, they write out a routine and stuff like that. Like I've tried that, but it just, it doesn't work for me. Like. I try to, in my trumpet playing, I try to dress what needs to be fixed that day. I have an end goal of what I want to do, but I try to just go off of what I feel. So when I pick tunes, I look at the instrumentation first and foremost. What do I have? And I have to do this now with my, my high school. So I'm teaching at my high school that I went to. So I'm a band director. I, I look at my instrumentation. Okay, do I need to write something out to make the tune work? Is something missing? Then I look at the players. Um, and I take this from the Duke Ellington approach. You you write for your band. So am I gonna pick something that's gonna really showcase my band or is it really gonna uh eh, it's gonna expose us in a bad way? Right. So that that's the goal. And I always pick something to challenge them and to challenge me as well because I, I it doesn't have to be a super hard tune like i think any kind of any level of music is difficult in some way um and i try to tell my high school kids that even we're playing you know we're rebuilding i'm rebu rebuilding the program so i lost 20 seniors to the you know pandemic year they graduated i mean i, I have like a 15 piece man so playing level is back down to like a grade one, grade two. You know, we had to go measure, measure by, you know, but I got them playing and we're playing music now. And it's like, but sometimes the, the upperclassmen, they don't see it that way. Oh, we're not playing hard music. It's not difficult for me. Well, you got to go where the band is. Mm -hmm. Now I can make it more difficult for you. <laughs> we all know that. Right. <laughs> so, it's it's I, I go by field and I'm I'm very observant of what the ensemble is and what what are we trying to accomplish here? Because with, with young people these days, man, you got to challenge them. Otherwise, they're not going to do it. So that that urge to do something, it, it's not really there because everything's accessible now. So. And I can tell I'm getting older because <laughs> I'm starting to say that stuff now. But yeah, yeah right. I, I just try to challenge them. Yeah. So yeah. And, yeah. And one more thing before I get off of that, when when I first got the Gremlin, my first day, on uh, they ex the directors asked me to speak to the band, you know, to introduce myself. You know, that was probably the most intimidating thing I did in my life. You go into that band room with 250 people in there, didn't go to HBCU, blah, blah, blah. I was just like, look, I'm so-and-so, so-and-so. I'm going to challenge y'all every day to get better. And I think people thought I was joking. No. Nah. That's what I did. That was my motto. And I carry that motto to, to this day. All right. Well, that, that is I mean, for an educator. <laughs> Actually, for anybody, that that should be one of the things that we all strive for. You know, uh, you know, to to make ourselves better first, and then to help others to get better. So, I mean, I, I personally feel that's kind of like our calling in life. Yeah, you know, that that's why we're we're all here is to 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 just try and make things a little bit better. But uh, 
it takes it take it's a challenge you know and i think like you're saying earlier especially with you know yeah i'm definitely the grumpy old man you know is that i think that uh you know because everything has become so assess accessible uh, you know, we have this this immediate gratification. Anything you want is at your fingertips. You, I mean, you can just get it immediately. And I think sometimes that um, you know the the new generation has lost sight of that fact that you you know that the things that are worth having are worth working for. And um, you know, instilling that at a young age, I think, is critical to the ultimate success of uh of any person you know the the sooner you learn that lesson and apply it and get it ingrained in you the better chance you've got of, of being tremendously successful in whatever it is that you're trying to do so uh as a you know but music i think has a special place because of the way you know way it works our brains and, and things like that and the the different skills that you learn with that so you know uh, as as uh, as an educator um you know, when you're, you already talked about like, you know, working with the band that you have, you know, understanding what you've got to work with and then how to maximize that. Um, what are some of the, yeah, I know that motivation is an individual thing, but what are some of the things that you definitely tend to lean on in terms of uh, creating a level of motivation uh, for, for people, because you're, you're dealing with people who, you know, the, the level you expect them to be at is here. And you've got to push them up here. And then like you're saying, you've got people that are maybe a little higher. Uh, how do you keep them motivated when the music isn't as challenging technically as it might have been? So, you know, how, how do you kind of play with with those concepts of, of motivation? Um, <laughs> when. This is, this is a good question. So I'll have uh, before the pandemic at my high school, they uh my band director, he was still there. He got promoted to assistant principal. Um, he had them playing a grade four music. So those kids are seniors now, and that's their expectation. But they're not understanding this was a pandemic. My middle school program was cut for two years. This thing, I look at this thing is like like a college football team. Cause I know that because I was a recruiter for a cop for Gramlin. You have to recruit. And I bring that mentality here in high school. So myself and the middle school band director, um, we talk all the time. He works with the marching band. And when I came in, I was talking to him when I was in Louisiana. It's like, look, we have to make this thing work because we have to build a program. It's only one high school and one feeder in our county. So we need to be like this, right? So I, I don't think the, the, the seniors, they were fighting me with that. They were so frustrated, you know? They're so, they wanted to play harder music and it's like, we can't do that right now. And they weren't playing the music that I was handing them absolutely perfect either. So it was my job to point out the mistakes. Like, look, you're not playing the rhythms right, or you're not playing the right notes. And I tell them all the time, like, I have a little bit of perfect pitch, so I know if you're playing the wrong note or not. And you're not gonna hide it from me. <laughs> so no sneaking. No sneaking. <laughs> There's no sneaking, man. So yeah, yeah. they're making mistakes just like the the younger kids are making mistakes. And I'm just like, stop looking at them like they're beneath you. Mm -hmm. This is a band. We're together. So I give them a little extra stuff to work on. You know, and the, the first thing is just how about you just play with a metronome? Because your rhythm is off. Yeah. And they want to, especially at this age, they want to play stuff fast, but they don't want to play stuff slow and learn, learn it slow. So it's like muscle memory and you just take it faster, you know? Yeah. They don't want to do that. They fought me all March of season on that. And they finally understood me. I brought in uh, an auxiliary, auxiliary cord and I hooked up my, uh, my metronome to it, Tonal Energy, the Tonal Energy app. I use that 
blasted the metronome and they were like, oh, oh, something's wrong. <laughs> it's like, yeah, this is what I hear all the time. I don't, I don't even need the metronome to hear it. Yep. Right? Yeah, you know, and it's so funny, well, you know, yeah. that, you know, people misconstrue slow with easy. It's yeah. like, you know, like we're talking about with Basie, you know, um, I am a firm believer that if you can't do something slow, you can't do it fast. You know, so whether it be slow practice or, you know, uh, you know, slowly going through things uh, because it exposes your flaws. You know, and sometimes it's easier to go faster because you're going by so quickly. You don't, you know, you don't have time to notice or other people don't have time to notice that things aren't where they're supposed to be. But when you, when it comes to like pitch and accuracy and your time and stuff like that, if you can't play it slow, you just, you know, you're faking it fast. Right. <laughs> and once they understood where I was coming from, it, it got a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and, and, you know, establishing that, that, that position of superiority, you know, the alpha, so, <laughs> but you know, it, it's kind of interesting what, what you're talking about, like with, with, uh, you know, if they're, if they were used to playing great, you know, especially the, the upperclassmen, they're used to playing great four, suddenly they're not playing that. Okay. You know, there's, there's this thing. Um, uh, I think this guy's name is Peter, Peter Nixon, uh researcher. Uh, and uh, he, he's doing studies on the effects of stress on performance. And uh, he developed this concept that called the human function curve. So, you know, if you want to Google that, you know, you can Google that. But uh, the, the basic idea is that, uh, you know, stress is a, is a necessary part of performance. If there's no stress, you can't perform at a high level. Now, if you have too much stress or the wrong types of stress, then your performance starts to decrease. So what we want to find is that healthy balance of the right types of stress uh, to, to push us on. So, so things like, you know, when you're getting ready for a concert, you're getting ready for a competition or, you know, getting ready for an exam, that's stress. That's something that's pushing you to move forward. Uh, you're playing a challenging piece. That's stress. Um, but the very bottom of that curve is something he calls the drone zone, which is where there's little motivation, there's little stress. And because there's little stress, there's little performance. You know, the performance is actually very low because you don't have the right amount of, of pressure. And it's kind of, I'm, that made me think, I, you know, when you're talking about the, the upperclassmen, it made me think of that immediately because it's like they're used to, to functioning at this higher stress level or, you know, mm -hmm. expectation level. And then when it wasn't that much expectation, then they kind of just fall back into that drone zone where it's like, oh, well, you know, this isn't that challenging. So therefore I'm, I don't have to work as hard as opposed to this isn't as challenging. I got to motivate myself. I've got to put some level of stress or expectation or, you know, change my perspective to keep myself engaged so that I can do this at the highest level possible. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's it, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, being a teacher, you know, you, you're, you're part educator, uh, you're part, uh, you know, social worker, you're part uh, psychologist, you know, you're, you're, you know, a parent, you're a best friend, you're a discipline, you, you're all these different things, you know, it, it's not simply just going in and, and giving them a downbeat and, and letting them go. Um, yeah, there, there's so many things. And I think that's why I'm so passionate about education. And I love talking to, to educators, of all types, you know, any, any subject, uh, because the people that are great educators, what I found, yeah, they know their stuff, you know, they definitely, you know, they know their stuff. But I know a lot of people that know a like tremendous amount about their subject matter, but they're horrible teachers because they have the, they are not able to connect and inspire their students. They can't right. pull the best out of them. So, uh, I mean, I can, you know, I can tell that you are passionate about not just, you know, music, but actually of helping to lift people up and helping them to, to gain those skills that are going to give them a better life. Yep. That's, that's the only way to do it. And, and I can tell you, it's, it's a little bit different in higher ed. Um, you have to, right. You have to deal with a lot more stuff in K through 12 in terms of like 
procedures and you know all the stuff outside of the classroom but there are a lot of similarities and and I told you know people when I when I interviewed it was like I don't look at you know they're just older kids to me in high, higher ed they're older students they're 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 really trying to grow up now it's their first time away from home right k through 12 well i'm doing nine through 12 it's you know they think they grow yeah, yeah. so you you gotta you, like you said you have to be a psychologist therapist uh all of that so that's something i didn't realize um what's going to be happening when i was in, when i was you know, going to school. I didn't go to school for music education. Mm-hmm. I went for performance. And I said I was never going to be a high school band director. And look what happened. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, I said I wanted to be a college professor. And I was one, you know. And it's, you know, it's so hard to win those jobs. Like uh, tenure track full-time but man k-12 is it's hard too yeah you know yeah and it's very rewarding yeah everything has got its own level of uh uh, of easiness and difficulty you know it it's you know to be great at anything you know you you have to just kind of find that find that groove and yeah it's funny because you know so many people have these um weird kind of ideas about what it means to be successful and uh you know it's like well if if you're not touring with a major act then you're not a successful musician you know if you're not a featured soloist you're not a successful trumpet player if you're not teaching at you know berkeley or you know juilliard you're not a successful teacher uh, if you're not on the higher education level you know yeah so it's like all these different things that we come up with that, that define uh, you know, that this is, you know, this is the epitome. Um, I, I, and I think that, you know, we, we need more talented, motivated, exceptional teachers in that K through 12 spot, because those are the ones, you know, that, that are, that are actually, that's, that's the real front line, you know, that's the, that's where, we're getting the the foundation built for the next generation of musicians, you know? So I, I think that there should be more emphasis. There should be more people that are proud to stand up and say, yeah, I, you know, I teach beginning band, you know, because, you know, I'm, I'm the person that is going to, to potentially produce the next Alan Vizzuti or, you know, Phil Smith, you know, because they all had to get a start somewhere. And, right. you-, and you never know. Yeah, you you never know, and, and you never know. Yeah, you could be you could be the person that sets that person on the right track, or you could be the person that completely screws it up for them. You know, right? right. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot of pressure, and, and but, and I I had those thoughts. You know, I went to VCU and UMD. I studied with some of the, the like some of the top trumpet players in the world, Rex Richardson. Chris Gecker, you know, I gig a lot now. I, I never thought I could do that being in, 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 an educator. I never thought I could do that. So I, I lived a life, you know, touring and paying my bills, just, you know, just playing music or writing. I do a lot of arranging too. Um, and it, it just, something was missing for me. Um, and in, even in higher ed, when I was at Grambling, you know, we, we went all, all around the country recruiting. So you got to see things firsthand at, at these high school programs. And you kind of see based on how they sound and how the, the kids act, what kind of band director they have. You don't even have to talk to the band director. You can already tell. And I could tell the ones who were just doing it just to get a check, you know, and it kind of struck me. It's like, man, why aren't these kids auditioning 
and knowing exactly what they need to do. They're only playing two scales. That's laziness to me. So it, it, I mean, I know there's a lot of factors, but even still, we got a pandemic and I'm still doing all these skills and I'm doing all this stuff with my kids. So I don't, hey, it, it's, you have to want to do it. And I, I, found, I found out I had that love for education in that moment. So when this opportunity came to go back to my high school, which is in the country, <laughs> Dinwiddie High School, uh, you know, I, I grew up here. I know what it's like. Uh, the Chesterfield County is right up the street, you know, a little bit be below Richmond. They have all these resources. Their bands were always good. You know, when I came, when I came through here, I, I made our district like every year since like middle school. I doubled on saxophone. And then I decided to just focus on trumpet my junior year in high school. And I made the symphonic band and all that. I made all state band uh, my senior year. And a, a lot of those cats that I went to school with at, at VCU as trumpet majors. So it was just like, I had this underdog mentality. Um, I had YouTube. I didn't have a private instructor. I had to go get it. And that's why it's it's kind of hard for me to like see this what's going on now with the generation. They just they're not pushing. So it meant a lot to come back here. And I left a really good job, you know. That's a job that people they don't leave. They stay yeah. there and they retire. That that job was somebody else's dream job. Um, and I could have just I could have stayed, but I needed to, I wanted my daughter to be raised near family and not through not seeing her family through a screen. I just I just couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. And we just came back here and I was like, you know what? This is my high school. I have pride. So we're gonna we're gonna make this thing work. <laughs> yeah. So and that's that the kids, they see that, they see that in me and they understand like this isn't this isn't just a check. So. Yeah. Well, and that's, yeah, that, that is so important because, uh, this is a, a, a thread that has gone through a number of, of the hangs that I've had. And I think it's because this is such a crucial thing, of, uh, not just for music, but just for life is, you know, you can't, you can't fool people. You know, you can fool them for a minute, maybe, but overall you can't fool people and who you are is going to come out in what you do and how you approach it. So whether it's your music or, or the way you teach or, you know, the way you parent, you, you know, it's going to come out how serious you are, how committed you are, how passionate you are. Um, and I think that on that emotional level, when we can connect with people, when they, when they can see that, that something is, is so important to you that you're able and you're willing to, give up on something that's good and like you're saying for some people this is this is like that would be their dream job you're willing to walk away from that because you feel called you feel driven to to do something where you're giving back and yeah you know, you're giving back to music you're giving back to your community you're giving you know you're giving to your family so that that willing to uh, willingness to to sacrifice uh, the good to get the great, because the great's not always the paycheck. The great is that feeling, you know, that you have, that you're going to have when you retire, that feeling that you're going to have, you know, when you're you're 80 or 90 years old. And, you know, when, when you're walking down the street and somebody comes up and, and says to you, oh, Mr. Cunningham, you know, you, you know, you really made an impact on my life. And, you know, that's, that's the sort of stuff that's going to last much longer than a paycheck. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and we had, we just, uh, our football team, uh, you know, they're really good. Uh, they won uh, State of Virginia a couple of years ago. Um, they lost in the second round in the playoffs. And, and I told my seniors, I was like, look, this is it. I told them to come down. It was a two minute mark in the fourth quarter. 
come on down. Let's take a picture. And then they got, it was so emotional for them. Like, it, it was like, wow, this is what I came back for. And we went to the band room. They did their senior speeches. And they was like, Dr. Cunningham, thank you so much for coming and believing us and dealing with us. And that's why I came back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and it's, you cannot, well, I know you can, uh, but people cannot understand the impact of having somebody who believes in you, you know, that so many people, and even as adults, and there's so many of us walking around that all we need to take us to the next level is just somebody to say, you know, I believe in you, you can do it, you know, you know, I got your back. That simple act can change a person's life. And especially when you're someone who doesn't have a whole lot going for you, where you're looking around you and all you see is, you know, poverty, you see, you know, you know, all of the, the negativity that's going on in the world, you know, the, the racism, the, you know, all of, all of the, all of those different things, the hatred, the bias, and, you know, that's all you see and that's all you know. And when somebody can just step in and go, you know, look, because of your situation, things may be tough, you know, it may be really difficult, but it's not impossible. You know, it is possible. So, but, but you got to work for it, you know? So, um, yeah, that, that's why I just, you know, I love talking to educators, but, uh, so let me, let me talk a little bit uh, w- with you about this, uh, because this is something I, I definitely love to talk with, with people who are, um, you know, in, in the educational field, um, is, you know, the system is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. There's a lot, there's a lot of problems going on uh, in terms of our, our educational system. Um, so if, if I were to say to you, you know, you've got this magic wand and you have the ability to wave it and to change things about the way education today is working, um, what, are the, what's, what are some of the first changes that you would want to see instituted? Oh, that's a heavy question. <laughs> I, I think the big, I'll tell you the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, since coming to K through 12 level, I've noticed the importance of, well, mm, let's see, having some skills in psychology. Just, well, not even, that's one part of it. The other part is just being a people person and, and, and social skills and as an as a K through twelve educator, you're dealing with people from all walks of life. And I did this in higher ed too, but they chose to go to that school, right? They're paying money to go to that school. This is public school. This is the school for our county. This is where you go, unless you go to a private school or whatever. But a lot of these kids, they come in here, they don't. A lot of them don't want to go to school. Like a lot of them don't like school. Um, a lot of them are working to support support their families. They're being forced to grow up really fast, and they're not getting that full like childhood experience. So, you kind of, as an educator, you have to know how to deal with different walks of life in one classroom, and then the whole school that the administrators that's what they do you know and i just i think that needs to be emphasized more it's not like in music school yeah we we focus on uh playing music and playing etudes and stuff like that like just put the horn down for a second and like just go talk to somebody (laughs) because that's what you're going to be doing on your job so you need to learn how to read the room. Um, maybe with this kid, maybe it's not good to push them a little bit, right? Try to kind of fall back a little bit and give them room. You, this kid, you might have to push them every single day. 
And it's it's the kind of things that I learned my first day here. So I, that's what I would say, just being a people person. It's a lot of things that you, you're going to run into that school is not going to prepare you for. So you, the biggest word I would say is being flexible. Yeah, I am. Yeah. <laughs> If everybody was a little more flexible, I think it'd be a completely different world, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so, you know, we've been talking a lot about education. Um, let's talk about your playing. You know, uh, so you said, you, sure. you you know, you you definitely have, you know, I have tons, tons of respect for for Rex and, and, uh, and Chris, you know, tremendous players, tremendous teachers. Um, so... You know what are what are some of the things uh, that that you've learned from them? Uh, you know, in terms of of your playing, like you know your your chops, your your approach to music, you know that that have helped you in uh, building your careers as a, as a freelancer. Fundamentals are key. Um, you have to take care of your chops. You need to do maintenance every day that you practice. Um, in order to have a successful law career and never underestimate any exercise. That was the biggest thing I took for those two. Um, and then playing, playing like other styles of music, uh, they all, both of them, you know, uh, Rex more so, he, <laughs> crazy soloist, uh, classical and jazz, you know, he's recorded with Joe Henderson. It, it's, it, you know, like he, he's that guy. And then and Chris Gecker, man, that's like, he's a legend. Like, and he, he just, he can play anything he wants to. So just having that, those two, their sounds in my lessons, like every week and just trying to, trying to match that, that, that was, it was huge. <laughs> I, I I can only imagine. Now you said something earlier that that I found kind of interesting. You said that that uh, like your approach to practice isn't like a you know a specific written out routine uh, that you kind of uh, tend to address what needs to be addressed. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, can you walk us through that process of, of like you know how you might uh, approach a, a particular day or a particular situation uh, and, and structure your practice around those necessities? Sure. Um, uh, so I, I always, always try to do, uh, some fundamentals. I, I like to start, I don't really bust the mouthpieces up as much as I did back in the day. Cause I kind of felt like it, it makes my chops kind of tight. Uh, maybe I overdo it sometimes, but what I really, I like to get the air going, um, and do air patterns. So I try to I try to go from uh, Vincent Chikowicz, his pedagogy, and I just try to get the air going. And I'll do air attacks. I took some lessons with uh, Jose Sabaja from Boston Brass, mm -hmm. and he was man, he grilled me on that. Just getting it, getting the note to come out in time with just the air, with a metronome on sixty. So I'll just do that on quarter notes like a quarter note to three, four, and just do that on, on any note. I, I usually start in the middle middle of the staff. And then once I get that going, then I'll try to match my articulation to it, make it easy going, make sure I'm not forcing it, forcing the tone with my tongue, because the tongue, just like with talking, it can be your worst enemy. <laughs> so. Uh, I try to make sure the air and, and tongue combination is going. I make sure I listen to records. Uh, so I have a sound concept. I'm increasing my sound concept. Um, I listen to a lot of uh, trumpet players, but I, I, I like to listen to other instruments as well. Try to get inspiration from them. Definitely string players. Um, I'll put on some orchestra records, but I'll listen to them on vinyl. Uh, just, uh, I was listening to the Marla Six the other day uh, by the Stockholm Chamber Orchestra, you know, 
just a, just whatever. I'll just put something on just so I can have something that I want to sound like. And I'll just go from there. Uh, the biggest thing I do is that and then articulation because I play a lot of different styles of music. I need to be able to do what I need to do uh, without getting tongue tied. Uh, so if I'm playing bebop or jazz stuff, like I'll I'll practice the uh, offbeat tonguing, I'll practice phrases like that. But I'll also do a lot of slurring and then tonguing at random spots and doing accents wherever I want to. So I have control of what I want to do, and not let the the music control me. Um, I, I I play a lot of piano. Um, I'll do horn. I'll do voicings. Not just two five ones. I'll, I'll sit there and try to like play just like re like regular piano pieces, like for like beginner level. <laughs> and I'll just go through and just practice reading four parts at a time on the piano um, every day. My kids, they be <laughs> they were like, "Wow, Dr. Cody, you can play the piano." I'm like, no, I can't. I'll just try to you know work on it, my ear and and just being uncomfortable so that those are the main things i do well that sounds great i mean it, it in in what you said about being uncomfortable um you know the, like there, there's old saying there's no growth in the comfort zone you know and i think sometimes we we fall especially with routine the routine has its place you know, the predictability, the consistency and things like that. And, and it helps sometimes, you know, when, when you have that same consistent exercise set of exercise you're doing, you can kind of gauge where you are at any given point in time because of how it feels because you're doing it every day. But the, the downside of it is, you know, like we talked about earlier about the, that idea of the drone zone, that, that when there's no stress, when it's the same thing, there's no challenge to it. Um, it's easy to kind of just mindlessly go through the practice and, uh, so you don't, you, that, I think that, that unpredictable aspect, you know, I love what you're saying about like you know, taking a phrase and, and slurring it and then putting, you know, articulating in, in spots that maybe you would not typically do that in, and just choosing where you want to place your articulation and, and where you want to accent, uh, as opposed to, to being dictated by what you've always done or what's on the sheet. Um, those are some really right. great, great ideas. I mean, I love that. Yeah, you know, it it's it can be a double edged sword, so you have to be careful with it. Um, so I sometimes I'll use a timer, you know, because I'll just practice all day. Um, but now I can't do that. I have a family. <laughs> uh, I'm a band director, so it's I have to be very like I can practice what I need to get done in in 15 minutes. In, during my planning period and be done with that. So it, it's it's just life. Um, I know the regiment stuff, the daily routine, like writing it out and stuff like that. I know that works for a lot of people, but for me, I just, no. Because I've been on the road for weeks at a time playing gigs and man, you never know, like your chops can just act a certain, a totally different way one day you need to figure it out because you got a show to play that day um yeah. you might have played too hard you know the, the night before you might have tried some stuff and you kind of feeling it so how do you address that you you know so i i, I like to i'm kind of like a sponge i like to listen to what other people do uh when they're practicing and i'll i'll just try it out and if it, it works I'll, I'll have something in my tool bag that i can use yeah I and mean, that that's i think that is the, the key right there is uh you know and instead of just like you know a lot of people tend to just soak they get stuck in this dogmatic approach to uh pedagogy so you know I am a student of, you know, I, I, I'm a, a Adam student, or I'm a, uh, you know, I'm a, a Chigawit student, or, you know, whatever, it is, the stamp, you know, so they get stuck in these methods, and don't stop to think that there are different approaches, there, there are tons of different approaches, and they're all valid, 
uh, to some degree. You know, they may not be valid for you, but they're, you know, they're valid for somebody. So being able to, and especially as a teacher, you know, of, of taking all these different approaches and be able to figure out, you know, hey, well, this is a really good approach. I really like this. Uh, this has got, you know, this is really great for this, but it's not so good for this. So maybe, you know, I'm not going to use it. But if I have a student who has this problem, then it's real easy then to, to have something to, to work with. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's just, that's, I think one of the skills that will help anybody take their skill, take their skill sets to the next level is to just add more by listening to more people that, that just like we do with sound, you know, listening to the people who, who have the skills that you're trying to emulate and pick up some of the ideas that they have in terms of, you know, their daily approach to, to playing the horn. So, but that's just me. I could be wrong. <laughs> no, you, you, you're right. And, and the other thing now well, at Grambling, I didn't really mess with the other instruments in the band that much. Um, but now I got to do that. But I had an advantage because I doubled on saxophone and I played, I messed around with the other instruments while I was in high school. I was a band geek. So I'm kind of bringing back some of those things, but I'm working on, you know, learning clarinet, flute. Those are the main two. And then trombone. I, I want to be good at teaching my kids. So I need to learn those instruments too. And that that stuff actually applies to my trumpet playing too, man. Yeah. Like it's I've been really focusing on percussion as well. I'll get back there and play timpani with them. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of that stuff, and I, I've been practicing rudiments on the snare drum. A lot of that stuff, like my time is so much better on trumpet now. Like the coordination. Like I, and I want to learn how to play a drum set just to get that feeling and doing multiple things at once. And, you know, you're doing piano every day, so you're doing different things at once. So it, it's, yeah. it's so many things out there. It doesn't have to be just flow patterns, chicken with stuff and R band. It doesn't have to just be that. You can learn something from anything. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, it, it's the difference between playing trumpet, you know, being a trumpet player and being a musician you know yes because you know like you're saying you, there, there's something you can learn from all those instruments like when you're listening to a string player uh you know if, you, if you're listening to a, a a great string player you can pick up so many different concepts in terms of phrasing uh you know the the, the flow and shape of lines things like that that you know articulation even you know granted we're doing it differently but it's still about making music and when you can understand and pull those in, um, one is going to help you, but two, you know, in terms of the technical aspect, but I think also too, it helps us in the most critical aspect of that when you understand the parts that everybody is playing, you know, not just the, the written parts, but, but the roles that everyone has and some of the specific things about that, then you can fit in better into a band. You know, when you understand what a drummer is trying to do, where you can understand how a string player plays, you can understand how to fit in with them so much easier. Yes. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, it's endless. And I, and I think that's what I love about, about music. There's, you know, not one person is going to know everything. You know, there, there's so many aspects to that you can focus on. Um, so just for me, just doing Arbin and you know the, the you know the, the the same trumpet stuff that we do like I I just like I can get a lot out of it yeah but there are other things out there too yeah so I, I just want people to know that like we don't have to play the same exercises the way that they're written you can just change it up a lot of stuff that I did with Rex and Chris I mean we transposed a lot of this stuff in the Arbin book, we did duets transposed, you know, put, you know, say, all right, we're in trumpet and E, let's go. <laughs> you know, so it, it's, you're just trying to consistently push the envelope and get something out of it. You don't have to sound great every time you practice. 
it's okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. Just just do something new, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and you think about like some of the you know iconic players of you know, like um yeah, if we go go from the jazz side, you know, look at, like Woody Shaw. Uh if we go from the classical side, like uh Sergei uh Nikitaryakov, um what both of them were inspired their playing was inspired not just by trumpet but by other instruments you know like you know woody was definitely inspired more by saxophone than he was by by trumpet in terms of you know his development of of his sounds and his approach uh you know the 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 intervals that he used um you know sergey you know so much of his his work is based on string playing you know and so that's what gives them that different sound because they're not trying to sound like every other trumpet player before them. You know, they're, they're pulling those inspirations from, from other sources. So, yeah, I, I think that that is, you know, such a, such a cool concept and that I think more trumpet players should li listen to less trumpet players, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause you, like you're at the point you, you have your sound, I mean, you you consistent, you, you know, you want to involve it, right? But man, do something else. Yeah, different, you know, different yeah. instruments, different music. You know, it's like you know, listen, listen to you know, if you're if you're mostly a classical player, listen to some jazz, listen to some country, listen to some hip hop, listen to anything, you know, and and just you know, listen to music, you know, and and there's there's a lesson to be found in all of them. So, but then again, I could be wrong. <laughs> right. Well, uh, Stephen, we've got uh, a couple of uh, standard segments that we need to get through before I can let you go today. Uh, and the first is a segment that's brought to us by uh, my good friend, Michael Barkley at Barkley Microphones. Uh, and this is called Sound Off. And uh, this is about sound. And we've talked, we touched on this a little bit about, uh, you know, developing a sound concept. So just, you know, what are some of the what are some of the things that you do, particularly as an educator of uh, of young musicians? What are some of the things that you do to help them to create a clearer concept of sound and and maybe some practice concepts that you give them? Um, I play for my kids all the time, like live in person. I play. Um, I'll play uh, records so everybody can hear it like on the pieces that we're working on and how they're like, I wouldn't say supposed to sound, but just giving them an idea of what, what the goal is. Um, just something to strive for. Um, if, if you, and Chris Gecker is huge on this. If you don't have, you know, something to draw from that inspires you in terms of listening, like what, what are you shooting for? Yeah. So that I, I, man, I always play for my kids because they're like, Dr. Gunner, we sound so much better when you play with us. And, you know, I'll put the match you know, on and I'll sit there and play with them and direct at the same time sometimes, depending on like what's going on. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's what sound is everything. That's if they don't know what it sounds like, how they, how they going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so who, like, you know, you were, you were talking about, you know, obviously working with, with uh, Rex and Chris, and I'm, I'm sure they're very influential on, on you in terms of your development, but uh, who are some of the other players that, that have, uh, you know, are that a part of your profile, your sound profile? I, I love players who are crossovers. Um, and they just, it seems like they can just play any style that they want to. Uh, but I, I, I love specialists as well. Um, my biggest um, is Sean Jones. Uh, just, I got to work with Sean Jones, like in person. He he was the guest director for uh, the Mid-Atlantic Collegiate Jazz um, Ensemble. I, I did that when I was a grad student at, at UMD. And he was the guest director, man. And I just got to hang out and, and talk to him. And I, I don't know if he remembers me, but man, I, I learned I learned so much from him. And he he inspired me. And just 
his ability to, he's so disciplined with his practicing um, and just being able to play whatever, what he wants to do, whatever he wants. And that's, that's what I wanted to do. So he's, he's the biggest influence on me for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you could pick a whole lot worse than Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Yeah. He, he, and I got live. Oh my gosh. That he, was, I, I li- he was his, his, one of his records was one of the first jazz records I listened to. And then, hearing him live man it was it was crazy yeah the first time i heard sean live was uh i can't remember what year it was but it was at uh itg and it was at king of prussia and yeah he was doing a master class and he did a performance and um i mean it was it was amazing i mean he's real deal and, and what what really nailed it down was i was um uh, i'll name drop for a second um I was hanging out like all week with Wayne Bergeron and his wife. And, uh, you know, Wayne's like, Sean's doing this thing, man, we got to go. And, you know, it's, it's like every trumpet player, like, you know, Wayne, uh, Vinny DiMartino, you know, all these different, you know, like big name players, they're like in there, you know, and you know, we're walking out <laughs> and they're like, yeah, man, he's, he's, he's the real deal. He's the real deal. I mean, yeah, you know, everybody just was just completely praising his abilities as a player, his sound, his, you know, just yeah, you know, everything about him. You know, Sean is just, yeah. You know, if, if, if you're listening to this and you have not checked out Sean Jones, you got to check out Sean Jones and Sean Jones, if you're listening to this, you got to get on this show, man. I got to talk to you. you know, I gotta- <laughs> Oh, <laughs> you gotta make that happen, man. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying. He, but oh, he's yeah. so daggone busy, you know. And, and you know, good for him. Yeah, good for him. All right, our next, segment, <laughs> our next segment is brought to us by uh, Venture Mouthpieces. Venture Mouthpieces, where technology, design, and craftsmanship intersect. This is geared up, and uh, if you are are in the market for some new gear, especially uh, your uh, next trumpet mouthpiece, check out Venture and use. Uh, the code trumpet gurus 21 to get 10% off your order venture is definitely a very cool company and vencad is amazing if you're a trumpet geek you can get in there and you can start designing your own mouthpiece and and you'll just never get away from your computer once you start doing that but anyway this this is all about our gear and uh more than just like you know hey man what what horn and mouthpiece you're playing but mostly again your concept of gear so uh as as someone who uh is intentionally in a in a position where you have to be able to play a variety of different styles whether it be you know working with your your bands or you know teaching your bands or out on a gig uh you know what's your concept of of uh picking gear and what are some of the things especially like as an educator you know you're you're working with these young these young budding trumpet players you know what kind of advice do you give about the process of finding the right gear for what you're trying to do yeah, I, so I'll say this first. Uh, uh, most of my horns are, are Yamaha. Uh, my B flat, my main horn is the the New York um, artist model. Um, I have the Chicago uh, C. Uh, Piccolo is a custom Yamaha, and I I just like the consistency of Yamaha horns. Um, I'm not saying I don't like Bach. I know that's a you know rival thing, but like I I'll play whatever horn, but I I just like the consistency when I pick it up and just I know it's gonna be right there, and I get the sound out. What the sound that I'm hearing, I I can get it out of those horns. So I I just I love the combination, and they're great for playing any style of music that you want, especially the New York. Uh, I just got that horn a couple of weeks ago. And I, I posted a couple of videos of me playing it. And I'm just like, if I want to play, if I'm playing a symphony gig, I can play it on air. If I'm playing with a brass quintet, cool. Playing it, salsa, whatever, it don't matter. It, I just, I got to make the, I got to, I have a sound in my head. I know what I want and I can just do it. Uh, mouthpiece wise, I go back and forth between a Bach 3C and a Warburton 4MD. Uh, so I, I've been going back and forth. 
Yeah. So. Yeah. So, like, when when you're working with your kids, um, like you know, young trumpet players, uh, I you know I know a lot of people have uh, you know, like the, right, you should try, you, know, you should be playing a three C in a in a thirty seven, uh, but. You know, I, I think sometimes, you know, the people lose track of that, that playing is a very uh, intimate thing. It's a very personal thing. And finding the right gear for the job is kind of hard. And especially when you're dealing with kids and, you know, like, you know, making the investment and, and things like that. So, um, you know, what are what are some of the, the words of advice that you give a, a young student who's looking to find a new horn? Um, you know, the, you know the advice that you give, like when you're trying it out, what are the things that you should be looking for in the horn? What, what are the things you should check on a horn? And, you know, how, how do you go about making those decisions? First thing, um, don't be afraid to try things. Um, second, I would say, have somebody listen to you on, on that equipment. Like I have, I have a group of, uh, trumpet professionals we, we call it the arena <laughs> there are trumpet professors at, at, at colleges one is in a navy band in dc and we we text each other all the time you know we're, we're all close and friends friends and stuff like that and we'll send recordings of ourselves just trying out new equipment just to see how it sounds you know and hey man they'll let you know <laughs> <laughs> so this is happening or it's not really happening this isn't really what you you know uh and then i the other thing i would say is how does it feel um if it's a, a horn if you're trying to horn let's say you want a darker sound or something and you try to get heavy trumpets and add the heavy stuff to it and you can't last a minute playing it it's probably not for you right um or you get like a super small lightweight horn and it's just, it's, it doesn't work for you. Like you have to go with how you feel too. Uh, and I, I, with the mouthpieces, I go by feel. First, I try to find the rim size that's comfortable. Somewhere around that, that the three range is good for me. And I, I used to play on a one and a half, one and a half back in college. And I, I was just working too hard. So I went, scaled it back and, and became more compact. That's still a, a bigger size compared to, you know, the other sizes, but it, it felt good for me. So I decided to stay around that ballpark. And then I just changed manufacturures, just check them out. Yeah. So again, be flexible, but be smart. Don't, don't blow your, your check on my, on my pieces. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, that, that, that's a completely different story. Yeah, that's a completely different story, man. You you can go down some serious rabbit holes on on that. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, I, I like that because uh, you know I've talked to you know everybody's kind of got their own personal slant on it, but um, you know a lot of guys are like you know well it's 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 got a it's got a hat it's got to sound good, but you know I've heard so many people say you know over the years and it's kind of been my my experience as well that you know when you pick up a horn the or a mount put in a new mouthpiece it may sound different right now but eventually the way you sound is going to come out of that horn you know one way or another mm -hmm. you're going you're going to start adjusting what you do to go with the sound concept that's in your head so right uh you know uh, but but instead of going letting the sound drive it get letting the feel drive it you know it's like if it feels good then you're gonna you're gonna play it more and the more you more time you spend on it the the, the easier it is for your sound to come out you know you're not fighting against the horn to, you know to try and create your own uh you know concept so yeah you, you're not doing as much manipulation if you will but uh yeah i, I like that idea of, of making sure that you know it's going to be the right tool for the job and uh, especially for for uh, a budding player man you know it's it's so expensive and you just don't want to you don't want to waste your money on on stuff that you're not going to use you know right. three weeks from now so. yeah and, and buying horns like if it, you can you can tell if they're serious if they're serious about practicing or not if they're if they show that spark in their eye like yeah i want to do this and i want to keep i want to do this after high school 
it's time to get a, a, a pro horn. Yeah. It's time to, it's time to make that investment. If they're not about it and they don't practice or nothing like that. Mm -mm. Yeah. That, that's, that's a waste for waste for their parents. You know? Right. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I'm with you on that. All right, so uh, time for our final segment. The final segment is uh, brought to us by our friends at Robinson's Remedies, Robinson's Remedy products to uh, show you chop some love after you get them beating them up on those hard gigs. Um, and this is a Robinson's Remedies rapid fire round. It's a series of questions that go all over the place uh, about uh, music and life. So uh, we're going to get going. So all I need is your fastest response to these questions. Dr. Stephen Cunningham, are you prepared? Yes. <laughs> all right. All right. You know, the passing mark is uh, 80%. This is a high curve on this one. All right. So question number one, who's the biggest influence in your life that is not a trumpet player? My father. Okay. What's your favorite book? The Barack Obama book. Okay. Just came out. Yeah, I haven't read that one yet. I got to get on that one. Um, what's the worst movie you've ever seen? Mm. Saw three. Oh, okay. Just don't say drumline. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, if you weren't a trumpet player, what would you want to be? Mm. I would be a, a businessman. I don't know what kind of business, but I would be a businessman. I would have my own business. Be an entrepreneur. Yeah, let's like. go with that. <laughs> All right, that'd be good. All right. Uh, what's your favorite drink? Sierra Mist. Okay. Um, you can uh, have a dinner party and invite any three living people, any three people in the world are going to come to your dinner party. Who would you want to have there? My wife. <laughs> your wife's going to um, be there, man. You know, she, <laughs> come on, man. Come on. Right, right. Um, I, I, I would say, I would say Sean Jones, Rex Richardson, uh, and probably Chris Gecker. I think that would be a good dinner. Okay, yeah, that sounds like a good dinner. All right, you got three additional chairs at your dinner table. You can invite any three people from history. Who would you want to have there? Martin Luther King Jr., um, Barack Obama. Yeah, Obama's alive, man. Come on. No, no. And yeah, he's he doesn't count. Let me see. Uh, Muhammad Ali. Um, Joe Frazier still alive? Or did he pass? I think he passed. Could be wrong. I would say Joe, Joe Frazier. All right. That'll be an interesting one. But yeah. Yeah. The fight's going to break out, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Lacquer plated or raw? Say it again. Lacquer, plated, or raw? Um, plated. All right. I don't What's like your favorite it, quote? Just, yeah. Uh, favorite quote. Yeah. Um, if it sounds good, it's good. All right. What's your greatest fear? Um, not being able to play music again. Uh, you could be granted one superpower. What would it be? Never get tired playing the trumpet. <laughs> 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 well, that's a good one. Uh, all right. What aspect of trumpet playing do you think is the most overrated? Range. Mm -hmm. Uh, what aspect do you think is the most underrated? Being able to read music. All right. Uh, you can go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice about music. What would it be?
Music is difficult. Never give up. All right. And while you're back there, you're going to give your younger self one piece of advice about life. Don't be, don't be afraid to ask for help. All right. And final question for Stephen Cunningham. What do you want your legacy to be? Uh, just, I'm, I'm just a passionate person. And I just want everybody to, to be better today than they were yesterday. Well, my friend, that is a noble, noble thing to shoot for. And uh, I know you're doing your best to, to make that true for yourself and for all of your students. So uh, I hope they understand how lucky they are to have someone who is so passionate about themselves, about music, and about just making the world a little bit better. So uh, thanks for taking time with me. And uh, it's super, super great getting to know you. And uh, I hope that our paths will cross in the real world <laughs> at some point in the near future. So, uh, you absolutely. Know, yeah, absolutely. Just so, you know, again, thank you so much for what, you know, what you do uh, to keep music alive and uh, to, to give us our next generation of, of musicians. So uh, it is noble and, and I applaud you for that. And I want to thank you for joining us for this episode of The Hang. Make sure that you like and subscribe and, and share and, and support and do all those wonderful things that you need to do to make sure that we keep The Hang going. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions or topics that you'd like to see covered in a future episode, drop them in your comment section. I'm always checking them out. So as always, folks, peace and slide grease. We out. Thanks for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating deeper connections through our mutual love of music and the trumpet life. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast and also like and share this episode with a friend. We want to see the hang grow for show. Please support our sponsors and consider becoming a personal supporter of this podcast as well. Remember, for less than the price of a bottle of olive oil a month, you can keep this podcast moving smoothly. The Trumpet Guru's Hang is recorded at the Candy Factory, a co-working space and social club located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Jose Johnson is the executive producer. Post-production editing is by Mitch Bowers. Our opening theme song was composed and performed by Lexi Signal. And our closing theme music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. Incidental music is by Ethan Swayze and Jose Johnson. Graphic design by Ann Kirby of The Sweet Corps. The Trumpet Guru's Hang podcast is produced in collaboration with the So Good Lancaster Media Group.